Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to Killer Women Podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Jacqueline Machard. Jacqueline is the award winning New York Times bestselling author of 12 novels for adults, seven novels for teenagers, and five children's books. These include The Deep End of the Ocean, the inaugural selection of the Oprah Winfrey Book Club. She is also a professor of creative writing whose short stories, articles, essays, and book reviews have been widely published. A native of Chicago, she now lives on Cape Cod with her family. Welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited Where to talk to you. Where are you in the United States? I'm in Montana. Montana. Oh, that's so mm-hmm. exciting. How cool. I, uh, well, it's about to snow on us, so it'll feel less exotic. But yes, I've been here about 20 years. I moved from the San Francisco Bay Area. We, we moved out here to raise our kids right after 9-11. And it's been wow. a wonderful, wonderful place to have a family. So I feel super lucky. Now, we are here to talk about a very inconvenient scandal, the latest by you and such a fabulous read. Would you please tell our listeners about this book? Well, what I like to say about this book is that it's everything that can go wrong <laughs> if, well, if you have a, no, if you have a family, but if you, if you keep secrets and tell lies and it goes on for generations, between parents and children and everybody feels sort of ripped off and everybody feels as though they kind of don't know what kind of ground they're standing on in other words they wonder whether they can trust the people who they can they should be able to trust the most right and it begins when Frankie Attleboro who is a young woman and a an up and coming underwater photographer comes home to Cape Cod to tell her widowed dad that she is expecting a baby and she's getting married, the undreamed of. She never thought she would settle down, but her dad has a big surprise for her too. He's marrying her best friend and they're also expecting a baby and they kept this as a surprise for her. And so that fractures the family, but that's only the first 20 pages. Uh, Everything- There's plenty of mayhem to come. There is plenty of mayhem to come. So um, in many ways, the story is about mothers and daughters, which is something you explore. And of course, you're a mother yourself. We were talking about this before we started to record that you have nine children, five sons and four daughters. So can you tell us a little bit about sort of what draws you to this type of story of exploring these relationships with between parents and children? If you scratch the surface of any human being, you're going to find childhood trauma or even childhood drama that has influenced the way that person grew up and the choices that they made for the rest of their lives. I had an old friend who used to say, crooked, straight, straight, crooked, that you would always make a decision to not make the mistakes that your parents made in raising you, but you end up making mistakes of your own that then in the next generation, your kids say, one thing I'm never going to do is (laughs) say what mom said about X, Y, or Z. (laughs) So you can't win, but you can sometimes emerge standing. My, My younger brother likes to say that we were out in the ocean with our parents who were really not uh, not particularly good at this. They, they were, um, that we were out in the ocean and, and our kids are on our, and we were out in the ocean, our kids are on the beach, but their kids are gonna be up on the highway. So <laughs> well, that's, well, for better or worse, right? I don't know if we want our children on the highway, but I well, understood. Yes. Up on the, <laughs> not on the highway yet. <laughs> on mountaintop. I get it. I get it. That's right. Well, we th- I do think 
And of course, as a mother myself, that's absolutely true. There were things I absolutely said to myself, I'm not going to do this to my child. And, and she's, you know, my, well, I had two children, my, my daughter's 23 and I am learning that, yeah, I didn't do those same things, but I did other things that were now like, oh, maybe that wasn't the best idea either. That is interesting. And the dynamic between, you know, these, these two best friends, um, God, it's so interesting because that is another thing. Like one of them left and explored and the other one stayed, you know, back in town and, and, and lived as what you we'd maybe consider a smaller life. Um, and yet, you know, they, their relationship, that, that profound, you know, connection of them between as children really is still there, despite the fact that Frankie has all this difficult emotion around what, she feels the feeling of betrayal, right? Because her mother right. is gone. She feels that Ariel and her father have betrayed her. And I guess in that situation, we used to talk about, in fiction, we used to talk about forgiveness. And now we talk about empathy. And I guess Frankie lacks empathy for the choices that uh, her father and Ariel have made. But those choices are pretty difficult to stomach. Yes. And I know that firsthand because this happened to me, not oh. with my best friend, oh. but this story was loosely inspired by my father. I'm writing a, an essay about this now called When Dad Married the Kid Next Door um, because my father fell in love with a woman I went to high school with, which, and I walked you know, this was a surprise to me. I literally walked in the door on the west side of Chicago and my dad said, meet my new girlfriend. And I said, you're Barbara. And I went to high school with you. Yes, she said. And it was, it was something that was very difficult to take. Yeah. I mean, we, we didn't live in Hollywood. We lived on, you know, we were a blue collar family from the west side of Chicago. And this wasn't, like David Foster marrying Catherine McPhee or something like that. This was someone who was known to me and a shocking uh, situation to walk in and see my mother's 25th anniversary diamond on somebody else's hand. It was just appalling. And I never got over it. Right. I never really came to terms with it. Maybe I would have if I had been a better person or if perhaps they had been more graceful about the way that they, I don't know. I just yeah. don't, I don't well, know. It, and your mother was gone. I assumed your mother. Had My mother had died many years before, like Beatrice in a very inconvenient yeah. scandal. She had died when she was only in her early fifties. And mm -hmm. I had been terribly close to her the way Frankie was with her mother. Ariel was estranged from her mother. One of yeah. them had, one of the best friends had a lyric relationship with her mother. And so did Ariel, who considered Beatrice another mother to her. Right. Because her mother had sort of taken off when she was a teenager. Right. And you would think of Mac, uh, who marries Ariel, as a sort of pervert if you didn't realize that he was never around. He right. didn't pay any attention to his own children, much less their friends. Right. And so it was only as an adult that he got to know Ariel when she was working for the Saltwater Foundation, that it was his foundation. And there is this, I mean, it's interesting that you talk about your own experience. I mean, I, I, um, you know, my parents also split and my dad ended up marrying um, a woman that he had had an emotional rela you know, relationship with ahead of time or whatever. And it is true. It's, it feels. What a cad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I a good father in other ways, but for Pete's sake. I know, but isn't this men? I mean, Jacqueline, I, I found out this is like, and this is all over social media for me. I've been very candid about it, but I found out at Christmas that my husband of 31 years had a two and a half year affair with his massage therapist. So I'm in the middle and of a it divorce. It would be a massage therapist too, wouldn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, everyone who knows where all your buttons are. Um, the, yes, yeah, of course. There's such absolute... intimacy. Yeah. And did you, you're still together? No, no. I tried. Oh. 
Good I girl. <laughs> I was going to say, you forgave that asshole. No, no. I'm sorry. I shouldn't swear no, on we, podcast, but no, you, you can swear all you want. It's true. And it's, um, I really tried. I, you know, I really thought, well, you know, we have these beautiful children. We have this beautiful life. We moved to Montana together and I wanted to, but he really couldn't get, I think he's just, you know, it is this midlife. It's this weird crisis where he, I think they're trying to regain their youth or I don't really know, but, um, no, I, I'm, yeah, no, we're, we're divorced um, or we're, you know, we're mostly divorced, but it is interesting. Like I, I look at him and think, cause of course there's so much betrayal and so much hurt. And I look at it and think you were with me when my dad did this to my mom. How could you, how could you do the same thing? Um, and there yeah. is a difference between men and women in that men are sort of eight celled creatures in, in many ways. They yeah. see what they want. And they take it. And yeah. it's very difficult for I, what I tried to portray in the book, that Mac was a very compassionate man. I mean, he went around the world trying to right. save species from extinction and charming audiences uh, of, of people with by interesting thing, interesting children and and uh, and other people in the in the natural world but when it came to his own natural world he had no idea why this would really upset his daughter right. he expected her to take the wedding photos you know and provide the cake he was just yeah about yeah that. but yeah, i do that not i think that's exaggerated certainly we always exaggerate in fiction but it's not really that exaggerated mm -hmm. I think it's a real, and I, I'm, it, what's crazy. So I'm 50, almost 53 and it is, and all of us in, you know, all of our sort of close friends are em becoming empty nesters and it's everywhere. Jacqueline, it's everywhere. It's like, I have like a half dozen friends that right now are get, like basically going through the same thing. And I think it's, it's like an epidemic. Um, and I do feel like, I, and then also like you have sons, I have a son. I'm like, okay, how do we, you know, how do we teach these men to be different than their dads? I mean, I, we're I like raising think, men differently. We're raising better men. I am I absolutely true. convinced of that. I have two sons who are married and uh, and they are exemplary husbands who are right there, you know, yeah. right there emotionally for their wives. I really think that this was perhaps in my case, I'm older than you by 10 plus years. And I think in my generation, there was a great deal more leeway paid to men, boys will be boys, yeah, you know, if you don't right. do it, some other women will. And my, um, <laughs> my mother-in-law is still telling me this when I refuse to clean up after my husband. And I always say to her, Listen, if some other woman wants to come and clean up after him and do a load of laundry, that is fine with me. She can yes. just come right in here and and take over some of this stuff and I will we'll be best friends. We'll be like sister wives. Anyway, um it yeah. uh, there was there was just a different way of looking at couplehood. When I yeah. was young and definitely women were in the down position yeah. and I'm not sure they aren't still in some key ways, mm -hmm. but not nearly so much as was the case when I was growing up and yeah. that was accepted. I was a rebel because I didn't want to walk in the footsteps of any fella and, you know. I was widowed when I was in my late thirties and the oh, man sorry. I married, that, thank you. Um, and the fellow whom I'm married to now is younger than I am. Okay. By 10, 10 plus years. And you can just see how different he is yeah. from my first husband who was older than I by six years and how how much more he was raised by a single mother he's much more aware of the responsibilities of women and how valid those are and how yeah. difficult those are and so it's a much easier road to hoe in some ways 
Yeah. I mean, and look at, I mean, you are a powerhouse of a woman. So I think that's one of the other things I've realized is that sort of men, uh, some men, and I, you know, this is not, I'm not, we're not bashing men because there's lots of wonderful men, but some men feel a little bit lessened by the sort of success of their of their wives and it becomes this like you know my success becomes sort of his, like his failure and I think that's and Chris is, was always a huge like he was always a you know really strong proponent of my writing and all that stuff but I do feel like I didn't need him in the same way that I needed him when I was young and I think that became hard you know, I think it's hard. They have a different sort of, they need to feel needed, you know? And I, I, I think that didn't, ha he, he wasn't getting that. So. Well, for years, my husband raised the kids and stayed home while I, because I was on the road. This was when authors were yes. all over, uh, at, at, uh, uh, some generations ago now I'm we're lucky if they send you to the CVS you know to uh, sign books on the rack I but know. it was a different uh set of circumstances then and I was pleased with that but I was also pleased when he took up his the reins of doing something of his own that he cared right. about because it made a huge difference in our relationship I right. think everybody has to have something that even if it frustrates you or uh, or doesn't f entirely fulfill all your professional needs is something that you're invested in and that you care about that's outside your relationship. Right. And outside your children, because they grow up and go away. And then, you know, you're left in a situation where the thing that you spent most of your time on, right. And certainly most of your resources, financial and emotional, sure. dis I mean, disappears from your life in a way that's, that you want, right. You celebrate that they grow up and, and, and launch, but then it, it leaves this big sort of, you know, and I, I think we underestimated how that would be for, for, you know, him. And I think that was really interesting too. I do. Coming back to the book, you know, I, I want yes. to talk about Ariel because I think her situation is also, you know, super profound. And the, and actually, it's 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 Ariel sort of um, her so deep desire to love and be able to marry Mac and also maintain the relationship she has with Frankie, you know, Mac's daughter. That is, I think, such a a beautiful example of sort of the contradictions in all of us, right? She knows how, why Frankie feels this way. And yet she also knows this is what she wants. And, you know, talk she about that. She feels that it's, it's just for Frankie to feel the way that she yes. does. She has enormous empathy for yes. the way that Frankie feels. But her, this book in some ways is about the search for love. Yeah. And how we all want to be part of something. In fact, Frankie Ariel talks about no, it's uh, the girlfriend, the the sort of mean girl from high school who's reformed, Ella Bella. Yes, uh, I love Ella Bella. Talks, um, who talks to Frankie and says, "You and Ariel had a we of me. You had." a contained and supportive relationship and we all envied it. Right. And that was part of why we tortured you. But each of us wants a we of me. Each of yeah. us wants to be um, someone who is part of something that is lasting and profound and deep. And it cannot be denied. Mm -mm. And I think the thing that's interesting is like, I mean, Ariel spent so much time at their, at, you know, at Frankie's house because her own home was so lacking in the things that Beatrice provided. And it really was Beatrice because Mac, as you said, was traveling so much. Um, and I think it makes sense to me, like emotionally, if you grew up the way Ariel did that, you know, stepping into Beatrice's shoes in, in that way, becoming yeah. Mac's wife is sort of the ultimate, um, you know, su success or, you know, rebirth for your, for a very hard youth, right? Yes. And also why she would, her mother, when her mother, and this is no spoiler really, when her mother returns 
because her mother, I mean, that happens early on in the story, although yes. she knows what's going to happen with, with Carlotta coming back. Ariel is very open to that. Yeah. She is poignantly grateful that her mother better late than never wants right. to be involved with her life so much so that she, um, is not at all skeptical, although Frankie makes up for all that skepticism. Yes, she definitely does. But it makes sense. It's sort of the way that we always, I mean, we rewrite the history of these broken relationships and these unhealthy relationships, uh, our whole, uh, you know, ever after, you know, we, we think like, what if, you know, if she showed up now, if he came back now and said, you know, re reformed and said he was so sorry and, you know, there's this part of you that just hopes, hopes beyond hope for that, right? You and bet. of course you're you're open to it. You're like, well, if it's different this time. So it's, I mean, the longing of a little girl for her mother is never gonna go away, right? No, it doesn't. And certainly, certainly I was in that situation too. My mother died when I was barely 20 yeah. and 19. And she um and she left a huge hole in our lives yeah because she was the one who did all the emotional work yeah she wasn't perfect by any means but my dad was gone in, right. in not gone physically but he was not there for yeah he wasn't equipped at all right Right. Of course and that's the how they were raised. I mean that's how that exactly. you know that's the generation of men they they didn't, ha they didn't certainly, they didn't get involved in emotion. You know, that was a woman's territory, you know, and, and, and women were, you know, hysterical. There's all these things that we learn about the way that our parents grew up. It makes, it, it makes it easier to understand their shortcomings, even if it doesn't make them go, you know, even if it doesn't still hurt. So Ariel's response to her mom, you know, and actually everybody's response to her mom is, you know, Mac is excited. Um, Frankie's brother is like, oh, everyone's sort of open to it, except for Frankie, right? Except for Frankie. Except for Frankie. And Frankie she sees what's underwater because she's yes. an underwater. She, yes. She sees what's below the surface and she is skeptical about it. And I think in part, that is a measure of her love for Ariel is that yeah. she just doesn't want her to be hurt. Again. And uh, wants to protect her if she can't, even though it isn't her place. So it's, it's a complicated story about yeah. people's uh, reactions to the way that other people's families run. And there are so many moving parts in terms yeah. of who was really responsible for what, when, that you don't find out until the story is well underway that it it um I wanted to make people wonder what's really going on under the surface yeah. of your own family yeah what do you know and what are you only going to know when you open a box someday in the future and find some letters in there I or know. something oh, because, you yeah. know everybody wonders what's the truth and right. even if we think our parents have been extraordinarily frank with us and I think I've been extraordinarily frank with my children sometime to their dismay yeah. that there are always things that people wonder about and really won't know until they become that parent and grandparent generation it's so true and I want to talk a little bit about sort of how you write but first I want to talk about the underwater photography because it's such an incredible first of all it works on so many levels right like you said she sees things under the surface and and it is and you know and it is a place where you know she gets to disconnect from everything and she, you know she's under her own sort of power it's magical I love everything about the way you use that career um and I almost was like I want there to be phot photographs in this book so I can see what she's doing but I love it so tell me how that came to you like you know was it a were you thinking of it as a metaphor or do you have I've experience? never thought of a metaphor in my <laughs> life Danielle <laughs> When people read my books and they say, oh, you know, the biblical symbolism of the guy who can't, I say, right. <laughs> um, but I have no idea, you know, that is underwater for me. You know, they call it the subconscious. Yes. Reason. But the truth is, I could not figure out a profession for this protagonist. Mm -hmm. Every in, um, 
what what do you want to say in literary fiction or women's fiction everyone is so there are there are some pretty standard um professions some people are professors many other people are pastry chefs for yeah. some reason there's just a, I mean the, the, the there's even a pastry chef in my yeah. story but I had to think of something that she could be that was intriguing but not intrusive I couldn't have her be a dentist they right. go to the office every day I right. couldn't have her be a neurosurgeon because I would have had to know too much yeah. about neurosurgery and, right. and that would have become would have become the point of the story so I had to find something that was alluring and which and visual right the the part I'm thinking of the part of her um looking out through the water and seeing whales underwater yeah. and wanting yeah. to call her mother on the phone and tell yeah. her about it yeah. that um that that would not intrude on the basic business of the story yeah and the worst thing you can do you know this you're an author the worst thing you can do is have someone be a writer <laughs> in a book right and right. it so my agent and I my agent said have her be I don't know have her be an underwater photographer and I said oh, okay and yes. I went right to work on that because there are such I mean Brian Scary and David Dublier you know the those uh mm -hmm. models that she followed were just um do extraordinary work and I got very very interested in the subject uh, sort of by default and now and I don't know what I'm going to speaking of I don't know why your podcast is called killer woman killer women but in my next book the one I'm working on now uh, one of the women is actually is a magazine writer interesting and the other one is a call girl <laughs> yeah I mean, those are, those as you are, do, right? <laughs> as you do. Well, and the other thing I love, I mean, we talk about killer women because you, we're all like, you know, we're killing it sort of like the, you know, powerful women, but also obviously women who kill people in their stories, if not in, in real life, hopefully. Um, but one of the other things I love about her, you know, about the fact that she, that Frankie is an underwater photographer is that pregnancy so changes, you know, her ability, like it, it really, her job is a little risky, obviously, because right. there's a lot of unknowns under that water. And all of a sudden she's going to be a mother and also your buoyancy changes, your body changes. So there's a lot of really interesting, like she, it's, it, it's intrusive in her job in a way that it, it isn't as intrusive as if you're a writer or a, it's intrusive if you're a call girl for sure, but it's not as intrusive if you're, you know, if you're other things. So I think in that way, it's also really powerful because she's so, she's so in love with this, you know, this, her new husband and the baby and all of that, that it, it becomes a sacrifice she's willing to make, which she probably wouldn't have been necessarily willing to make, you know, years before. And I love that. Absolutely. Element. She would not have, and she's reluctant she she has to really give herself a talking to because what if she if you run out of oxygen and you're underwater and you die and you're single that's a tragedy yeah but if you are a mom and a wife and you have a young family it's an absolute catastrophe that yeah. destroys other lives as well yeah so she just wasn't able to justify the risks that she took before now i know many women who are for example firefighters yeah and they have children yeah but one of them explained to me how often do you really do this you know mostly i cook chili yeah. at, at the firehouse and i go out and someone has set their couch on fire and we put that out and then we go home right it's very rare that i'm going into a fully engaged house to rescue people you know right. that probably happens four times in a career right but there's so, police i mean you think about po the police officers true. who yeah i mean but i also think it's it's particularly valid for uh for frankie whose mom died right like so she knows what it's like to have that that gap in her life and so she's also going to be I think because of that much more risk adverse around her own son right and the loss that he would feel 
had, you know, if he were to lose his mother. So it just, it add, it's a beautiful way that you've added another layer. I mean, and, and I think to your point, and I understand this from my own working, it's all of a sudden these things, they layer themselves and you don't quite, you didn't quite plan it, but then it no. turns out so beautifully. And I think she that's talks such- about, She even talks about wanting to raise her son to take risks. Yeah, that she doesn't want him to be the kind of person who hangs back. Mm -hmm. And yet thinking about, you know, as a mother, you think all the time about how much, how much, I, I don't know how much risk they can bear. How much can I bear? Exactly. In terms of seeing them uh, do things that I just sometimes wish I didn't know about. Exactly. You want to wrap them in bubble and be like, okay, just sit in the corner. Right. You'll be fine. Exactly. Right. So tell us for, you know, what's the process of, of this book? Like, you know, I, and you obviously hugely successful, written a ton of wonderful novels. How do you do it? Is there a method? You know, are you a, do you sort of figure it out? It feels so organic. So I'm curious to know if you're, you plot the, you plot it. I figure it out to the, almost to the word. Before I ever start to write, I need to know what the first sentence is and in a general way, what the last sentence is. Okay. And the whole progress of the rest of the writing of the book is to get from that first sentence to the last sentence. But you know what your goalposts are. You know what the scenes are going to happen, how it ends. And I do not understand how my friends, all my friends say, I start with a character and I look at the character and... Uh, and I'm fascinated by that person or that image, and I have no idea what's going to happen in the story. That comes to me as I write. That would make me nuts. <laughs> I could never do anything like that. I'm a very planful person. Uh -huh. Like, I have to go to somewhere for this book in November, and I said to my husband last night, can you find my yellow suitcase? And he said, wait a minute. And I said, well, you know, I, I want to pack my suitcase. I just want to know that I'm not going to forget. <laughs> You're, I'm, I'm that way about that kind of thing as well. That is exactly. He's like, are you leaving tomorrow? And you're like, no, but I want to be prepared for when it's time. And he's packing. If he has to go someplace for work or if he has to go someplace with friends, he starts thinking about that the day, but he starts thinking about Christmas the day before too. And I keep saying, Chris, for God's sake, it happens the same time every year. <laughs> Don't you realize that that's not going to change and yeah. that most people think about it. They don't go to the mall and buy everyone some stuff from the kiosk on Christmas Eve. That is oh, so, you know. <laughs> well, speaking of, you know, finding, you know, planning and finding time. You have nine children, which I think is so extraordinary and fabulous. And you've been doing, like we talked about this, you have, they're about 20 years apart, start to finish. Um, right. Um, and of course, so you really, you know, you are, you are always writing within this, the sort of pillars of being a mother. So how right. do you, they're older now, obviously, but you did this for a long time when they were little. So how, right. how do you, how did you set up your life you know, and I still wonder how you set up your life. Like, doesn't one of them call you every day for something? Yeah. Oh, sure. Of course. There's, it's like whack-a-mole when you have that many <laughs> children, you know, the minute you think, okay, this is great. You know, then somebody, the school calls and says, hmm, Atticus was tardy for the seventh time um, uh, or something. Yeah. And uh, it, but it, or something worse than that. I'm lucky if it's something that minor, yeah. it is. Uh, I've always said that I have really low standards for the children and, but that isn't true. I mean, no, I'm a very careful not. mother. I'm a very noticing mother. I'm shocked when I learn things that were successfully kept from me by like all nine siblings, because they have a relationship below the surface and, uh, and that I knew nothing about because I think that I'm pretty much on the ball and they are my, obviously, my highest priority. Yeah. So yeah. if I'm able to write, which I care deeply about, and that's like my fifth highest priority. Yeah. Then it must be something that is really important to me. And they have made a significant number of sacrifices of my time 
for that pursuit for me to write, which also helps to support them. Yeah. But yeah. they don't really care about that. Yeah. But especially when my older children were young, they minded, they really minded yeah. that, um, that I would go away uh, to work on a story or something like that. And it would be intrusive and it would rob our relationship of time together. Yeah. And is there a way that I justify that? There is not. It just, it happened. Yeah. And that was the only way, especially when I was a widow, yeah. that I could manage to do this. Yeah. And yet I knew that there was very, I had very few choices in terms of what I could do, that right. I, I had been a newspaper reporter, I had been a speech writer. And when I got the idea for my first novel, which was The Deep End of the Ocean, I I never imagined that I could write something at that length, but I did. And, you know, it was successful. And mm -hmm. to, uh, so I went on with that. And it has always been, it's not the kind of job that you can leave behind mm -mm. at the end of the day. Mm -mm. It's a 10th child for you. I mean, that's the thing about these books, right? Is oftentimes, you know, my children, I'll come up from a day of writing, my children are talk to me and I'm still having a conversation with one of the characters. So right. it is right. a, you know, and there's, a, there, I think, you know, still for women, although I think we talked about the fact that things are changing, but there's a lot of guilt associated with, you know, you know, leaving your children, right? To pursue something, especially something that feels like, for some reason, it, it seems like it would be easier to justify if you were going to an accounting job than it is to go to, you know, a writing job. Yeah, because that's artsy and and mm -hmm. somehow lightweight, even though it isn't. Mm -mm. I mean, Stephen King, God love him. I mean, he's a wonderful fella, but he describes when the children, his children were young, that he had a room and he would, you know, a studio and he would go into it and no one but the dog could come in for three weeks and his food was outside the door. Give me a break. Yeah. I mean, that was, if that I, was Tabitha doing that, right? I mean, right, yeah. right. Yeah. You know, if, if it were me, when I came out of that room, social services would be here. <laughs> you know, it would, right. I, Your children I would, would all be gone. They right. would have taken them away. It's right. so true. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's just a different world. Yeah. It's a different world. And many men, many male authors, again, you know, some of my best friends, they have no idea why it was so hard for me to prioritize because they just did it. Yeah. And the devil took the hindmost. Yeah. And it's funny though, even though we, we, we are, you know, society is giving us, you know, or we're earning or we're scratching out or however we want to put it more, you know, more autonomy, more independence, more ability to say, this is mine. I still think if it's biological or societal or patriarchy that is telling us it's still not quite okay. It's not quite okay right. for you to pursue this thing versus your husband. Even if you guys consider each other, you know, yourselves equals and you're both doing equal, it's still for some reason is less acceptable. Um, for us and that is i think even to even to our even to women i mean my my uh sister-in-law will sometimes say to me um she my brother had a major career and my sister-in-law has a, a minor job after 20 years of staying home with the children yeah. and she would say things to me like you have to do everything possible for chris's career and i i would just say what um because it was so foreign to me to Mm -hmm. uh, to sublimate my, but, you know, even listen to the language of what you just said. You, we, we wrested that from fate. Mm -hmm. We grabbed it. It wasn't <clears throat> expected or even necessarily desired for us to do that. Right. No, I think it, I think there's a lot of people, you know, men and women who would be much more comfortable if we were just happy to do you know, the sort of traditional role of having, raising children, you know, and I think it's true that there is, prop, there's a deficit in community because we're not doing that, but it, it shouldn't be our responsibility. It should be a no. shared responsibility, right? 
there's a deficit in a community in community anyway because so many people more women now than men work outside the home yeah you know a, a greater number well more than half of women work outside the home as well as men so there isn't that sort of uh neighborhood feeling i mean the closest thing i have to that is my book club yeah that, yeah that is a community organization for me because i'm not a church goer and things like right. that that those other traditional sources of community are not as much present in the world that we live in now now i don't miss them i'm not someone who wanted to be to join things and and mm -hmm. be part of something and I'm really happy with my very few friends and my own company and resources because yeah. I feel like my head is filled with people. They're yeah. not real. <laughs> right. No, I, but, I, I, yeah, that's I, something you don't want to say to a psychiatrist. No, <laughs> not unless you tell them what you do for a living first. Right. But, right. but, you know, I think the other thing is because of sort of the situation, women, we create these incredibly strong friendships we don't need very many of them but you need that person you could call in the middle of the night and be like I gotta take one kid to the hospital can you come sleep here so that I, you can be with the other or whatever it is you know and I think that is the way we create community and it becomes sort of like like you said like your book club a female driven female I mean my book club at least is, it's you know it's all women and we we Mine it's not too. just the book we you know we 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 talk about everything we share you know celebrations and tragedies and trauma and all of that and it becomes this very small community but so so tight-knit you know and I it's know. we're lucky if we spend <clears throat> 10 minutes talking about the book by the end of the evening you know there's right. people have drank two bottles of wine and talked about this one's marriage and this one's divorce and right. their kids this and the other thing and uh, but we it is almost like a almost like a sewing circle yeah. from generations ago. Yeah. You don't end up with a quilt, but you end up with a tapestry of, of relationships and personalities, all yeah. of them accommodating each other. Yeah. It's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. And I, you know, I thank God for that because that's the thing that saves us so many days. Right. Yes. Well, and I, I'm, and I'm not going to talk about the end of the book, but I love it. Um, and um, I really, it's just so, there's just so many layers. And I think we could talk for like nine hours about this book, but I did want to ask you what you're working on now. I, I hate to celebrate a new book and then, but everyone wants to know sort of what's going to be next. When I was a young reporter, and whenever I say that, one of my kids says, when I was a young warthog, um, <laughs> um, it, it went, I, but it's true. The first criminal case that I ever covered was about a young woman who was accused of, she was a call girl, but she was a call girl with a twist. She had been a brilliant straight A scholarship biology student at the university who gave that up to become a hooker, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and no one knew why. And she was accused of murdering two of her, uh, and convicted of one of them, of two of her most devoted clients for the life insurance money. Mm. And it, and I covered that trial. I was fascinated by her. Yeah. She was yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, you know, and uh, clearly very scholarly, not exact, not at all. And I don't know how to do this. I mean, not at all the kind of person, you, you, you know, not Stormy Daniels. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, though she probably has depths I have no idea about. exactly yeah I know what you mean she's not but the she, cliche but we expect right I wanted to in in stories and I don't know if you do this too we try to understand history but also to reconfigure it mm -hmm. and correct it and provide explanations for things that have no explanation so I decided to write she had <clears throat> this real life person had a great interest in ornithology the book is called the bird watcher and it's about her neighbor 
who grew up with her and who now is describes her. She's the accessories reporter for a magazine like Vogue, uh, writes about purses and um, and purses and other kinds of uh, yeah. Jewelry, yeah, yes. jewelry, yes. belts, accessories. That's so and, fun. Yeah, purses and belts. There's a jewelry, uh, a jewelry writer who is uh, specific at that magazine because jewelry yeah. is a big. Thing. But she gets permission to cover this story and to write about her former friend and her former neighbor and what took her to this place, and it's sort of the story of what she finds out about other people's choices yeah. and um and how she tries to change things well that's all i'll tell you yeah fair fair well i have to say i you know and i love i absolutely love the idea that first of all the fact that this the real life woman was also an avid bird watcher like that you know or into ornithology i feel like that is we are such a bundle of contradictions and i think maybe that's the beautiful place to sort of to end because I think you do an extraordinary job of capturing those contradictions, which when we really parse them out, aren't so contradictory, right? Because we have, we can feel such ambivalence over so many things that we, we basically cast ourselves in two very different lights. Uh, and other people cast us that way. And so we are, we're, we are contradictions that I love. I can't wait for the bird watcher. We are many things. We are many things. And um, it confuses people sometimes when we won't stay in one in one right. lane. Right. We keep changing lanes. But right. that to me is the reason for fiction. It's to hover above and watch people change lanes. And you do it beautifully. Jacqueline, this is such a wonderful book, everyone. I, you Thank have you. to go and get A Very Inconvenient Scandal. And I'll look forward to hearing what you think of it because... Um, it is just beautifully nuanced and, and complex and obviously fabulously written. So, um, Jacqueline, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Such an incredible chat. Everyone, this is Killer Women with Jacqueline Machard. Don't miss a very inconvenient scandal. And we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.